everyone, this is Kelly Mara here, and no, it's not calamari. Welcome back to my channel, or if you're new to the pond, go ahead and take a dive. You might like it here. Today, we are talking about my latest hyperfixation, Baldur's Gate 3, or at the very least, the characters, which everyone who has ever been in a D&D campaign knows is the most important part of playing. So obviously, spoiler warning for the companion quest lines and their romance routes. Okay, so it's not a secret among my friends on Discord that I have been playing Baldur's Gate 3 non-stop. So far, I am 150 hours and 2.5 and campaigns into the game, though to be fair, my sister also plays on my account and computer, and that adds to my hours. But most of the time, it's me playing, I admit. Everything about the game is so satisfying, from the combat, navigation, looting, the character interactions, to the all-important dice rolls. In this video, I will be trying my hand at drawing these characters I've been staring at for nearly 200 hours now, and give you some tips that helped me capture their likeness better while dressing them up in clothes I think they would wear if they lived in modern day. Without further ado, let's dive right into it! Starting with Astarion Ankunin, his name being something you learn when he takes you to his grave at his final companion scene after beating Kazador, who is arguably the face of Baldur's Gate 3 and the most popular character to come out of it so far. I mean, how could he not be? He's a high elf and a vampire. That's like if you fused Legolas and Edward Cullen together. Just one of those on their own is already going to do well, but both at the same time? Larian knew exactly what they were doing. Mans is so pretty, and I really wanted to do him justice, so let me show you some aspects I picked up that helped me capture his likeness better. Mostly around the face and head area. So, focusing specifically on that, Asterion actually has very round eyes, and I was pretty surprised about this. I expected a more kind of slanted, sultry shape, but they're actually quite big and heartwarming, like how a cat would look at you when it wants food. His nose is very straight, tall, and slender, so kind of like your typical anime boy nose if you need something for reference. And of course, his hair is actually swept back and parted to the right, his right in particular, and has a very wavy, voluminous texture, which we know from the game is actually a result of pomade. For his clothes, I wanted to put him in something stylish and flamboyant, like something you'd see on the cover of Vogue. It's noted in his page of the Baldur's Gate 3 concept art book that his clothes are a mix of 18th century libertines and European rock stars of the early 90s, both very fashion-forward concepts at their respective times. They chose this aesthetic specifically to echo Asterion's desire to live a life without restraint. So I personally think the supermodel lifestyle of parties, networking, and international travel would really suit Astarion. And Kazador, the evil vampire lord who is his master, is his evil manager that he wants to eventually separate from but is still bound to by his agency's contract. Anyway, back to game Astarion for a second. Obviously, he's super popular because he's super pretty, but it takes more than just looks to impress me. I didn't actually come around to Astarion until pretty late into Act 2 of my first campaign. And you might be wondering why I said two and a half campaigns instead of three or two earlier. And that's because the very first campaign I did, I ended up not liking how my character looked anymore, so I decided to restart. Luckily, I was still in Act 1 and I hadn't gotten too far into the story yet, so it didn't really count. I swear most of my time spent in that game was just on character creation. I kind of wish they had sliders for all the facial features instead of just having preset faces you can't customize at all, but that's what mods are for, I guess. <laughs> So as I'm drawing the close-up of Astarion here, you can see his facial details a bit more clearly. And what I've noticed about Astarion is that he has a rectangular head shape that is still very like sharp-edged but also long and narrow. Being a high elf, he has high cheekbones, an angular jaw, and a strong chin. Just everything about him is very angular and sharp, but also delicate and beautiful. 
As you can probably tell by now, this drawing is very different from my usual art style and I tend to do that when I'm drawing while referencing an existing character um, or just real people um, if you've seen some of my um, fan arts of actual YouTubers. And uh, part of the reason I decided to do this video is to kind of challenge myself a little bit and practice drawing men to be more comfortable doing it because I feel like I struggle a lot more drawing guys than I do drawing girls. Anyway, my first actual campaign didn't count. For my first run, I decided to play as my character Colette, whom you might recognize from my series Wild Word, so obviously she needed to be a rogue. Unfortunately, that meant I didn't really need to have Asterion in my party because I didn't realize that you could ask Withers to change the class of the other playable characters. Initially, I was exploring with him, Gale, and Shadowheart, but then I realized there's really no point in having two rogues in the party, so Asterion was sent to Camp Jail in favor of Lazel. And then I swapped Gale out for Will, and that was my party for a while. Unfortunately, that meant I never built up enough approval with Astarion and he rejected me at the tiefling party, which apparently just hard locks you out of his romance completely. Now, I am a safe scummer through and through, and I'm not afraid to admit that. I play for myself, and I want to see all the possible outcomes. But for Asterion's rejection, I didn't really care enough about the romance aspect that I never reset and just went on with my life. I ended up accidentally doing a no romance run because Colette is repulsed by even the slightest hint of affection, and every time a character would come onto her, the in-character part of me just revolted to the point that Withers called me out on it. But I did really like Astarion's design, and I do find his dialogue amusing, so I decided to give him another try. After changing his class to a paladin! How chaotic is that? But here's my logic. I found Lazel pre kreshelek absolutely rancid, and she kept arguing with Shadowheart, who I needed in my team way more than Lazel. So I needed a fighter that can tank hits and be a meat shield for the rest of my squishy party, while being capable of supplementing additional healing when I want to spend Shadowheart's spell slots for Guiding Bolt or Spirit Guardians. And you know what? It worked out so good! My Paladin Astarion is an absolute beast that hits like a truck gets 3 attacks per turn, heals, and is proficient with heavy armor. So at the adamantine forge, I forged the adamantine scale armor and put it on him, and he looks really good in it. And the longer I journeyed with him, the more he grew on me. Cue my second campaign, where I played as myself. Did I finish the first campaign? No. I had a feeling I was missing out and decided to start over again and go through everything with a fine tooth comb. I made myself a half wood elf monk who. Half wood elf? What? I made myself a half elf subspecies wood elf who can bend the four elements to her will. Look, if you're gonna give me the opportunity to become the avatar master of all four elements, I'm gonna become the avatar master of all four elements. But in this second playthrough, I decided to try a bit harder to get character interactions at camp and... Oh boy. Here I thought I was special for not doing any of the romance routes when in actuality, I was missing a lot of the story and context for those characters. For Astarion, he's sassy and theatrical, but you can always tell when he's putting on an act and when he's being sincere. Astarion is one of those characters where you shouldn't take everything he says at face value, and it's more often than not he's using a facade to protect himself from the people around him. Plus, he's just my ride or die. Every time I want to try a... an unconventional approach, shall we say, he's the only one who will approve! Like, no matter what crazy thing I want to do or say, he'll be the only one backing me up, and that's why I love him. There's a statistic on Lorian's website that says that over 100,000 people have been rejected by Astarion, and one of the things I love about him is that, just like every cat, he has to come to you. 
And I love a person that isn't so forward in pursuing their romantic interest, unlike the rest of the other party members. I'm looking at you, Lazel. As you might be able to see here while I'm shading, I'm picking colors like purples and pale pinks to really accentuate Astarion's pallor and make him look kind of bloodless and corpse-like, which obviously he's a vampire. Um, and it's kind of different from any type of shading I've done before, but it, it was actually pretty fun. And I think I managed to kind of capture that corpse-like feel. So, I don't know, let me know what you think. But here's the thing with drawing in a more realistic style. You also have to do a realistic nose, which is something that I, I really struggle a lot with. I don't know what it is about noses that just, it always eludes me. I don't know, why do they, they, they freak me out a little bit. I always see people online saying how easy it is to draw like realistic noses, but I think it's just the nostrils that always get me. I don't know what it is about the nostrils that just kind of freak me out. Uh, but anyway, Astarion's eyes were also kind of tricky for me to capture in a more realistic style, particularly because I had to remind myself that he has round eyes. He doesn't have sharp, angular eyes. And generally, I'm not really sure how I feel about these set of illustrations because my art style has gone completely out the window for this one and it's almost unrecognizable to me and I don't, I'm not sure if I'm pushing too hard for realism and accuracy at the expense of my individuality. So I'm not sure how I feel about it. As I've said, he's like a cat. He decides when and how he wants to do things, enjoys causing senseless but harmless chaos, and you shouldn't tell him what to do. People have said that you have to play an evil character to romance Astarian because he disapproves of general heroic acts and being nice to people, but I've come to learn that his disapproval over things like that are more like sassy little eye rolls that doesn't really affect his approval rating of you as much as treating him as a person and respecting his autonomy and being nice to him. Plus, there are some heroic acts that he does approve of. For example, freeing people under oppression, like the gnolls that are being compelled by an absolute cultist in Moonrise Towers, or freeing the owlbear cub from the goblin camp, or even giving Yena some coin after she asks you for help looking for her mom. Astarion always roots for the underdogs that don't usually get much love. Creatures that are generally hated and perceived as monsters. Kind of like him. I don't know if it's just me, but when I hear that Astarion is a toxic red flag who you can't trust, I expected him to be way more toxic and betray you at some point in the campaign or seriously duck you over in some way, but he doesn't. He's actually pretty tame to me as far as toxic characters go. Yeah, he starts off only being nice to you because he needs you, and if you go to romance him, he seduces you to get your protection, and uses you in a way, but you know, he never actually hurts you or has the chance to. <laughs> Instead, he ends up finding that he does sincerely care about you and the rest of your party members. If you have him in your party when you go to the Githyanki crash and let Lazel go into the Zaythisk, I know this sounds like a bunch of gibberish if you don't play BG3, Astarion will actually be very concerned for her and urge you to save her. And something I don't see enough people talk about when it comes to Astarion is that unless you're doing a dark urge run or ascending him at the end of his companion quest, he genuinely changes for the better through the course of the journey. He's very sweet and devoted to you, and he'll even say you changed him for the better. But I kinda disagree with this notion. People only change if they want to. You can't make someone change if they're not willing to. So the fact that Astarion often asks you what he should do and changes is because he wants to. I don't think he's a bad person or like a completely bad person deep down. Or maybe he used to be, but he's been constantly punished for 200 years, so like, I like to think he learned his lesson. Maybe. 
So, you didn't really fix him. He fixed himself. You were just there to give him the support he needed. Something that he never had. Also, if you complete Astarion's companion quest, you find out that he was only 39 when he was turned into a vampire, which is still a baby in elf years, and even still has his baby name, meaning Little Star. He hasn't even gotten his adult name yet, which elves only get at the age of 100. So yeah, Astarion lived a pretty tragic life, though I can't really say if he ever lived an honest life. His entry in the BG3 concept book says that he's a corrupt elite who has always sought power and eternal life, and the whole reason he died and became a vampire spawn was because he was a magistrate that made a ruling the girl were not happy with, resulting in his murder. Good news is, he might still have a family even after 200 years of forced servitude, since high elves live to about 750 years. I guess what I will say about Astarion's romance is that it isn't for everybody. Because aside from his looks and the vampire elf Wattpod fantasy, he really doesn't offer much in terms of courtship compared to the other companions. Astarion is not romantic or sentimental. Everything he says is always backhanded because he, that's how you, he protects himself. He's very avoidant and hates being vulnerable. And that's exactly why I like him. Because I too am this way. Getting emotional and mushy makes me want to escape from my own body. Romance with Astarion is very much about being patient, providing companionship, while still being independent from each other. It's very well suited for someone who really values their personal space and independence, and I know I got in trouble for saying this on TikTok, but Astarion is so ace-coded. There's something to be said about the fact that once he finally got his autonomy back, he preferred not to do it. As in the dirty. Because if you talk to him about being in a poly relationship with Halzen, he won't deny you, but he will ask if it's because you guys haven't hit it in a while. If you bring him to the Drow Twins after you're together, he'll actually refuse to partake. That to me implies that he's only been having the dirty because he was pressured and felt he had to, whereas he feels safe with you and knows that you won't force him to do anything he wouldn't want to do, so he felt safe saying no. This also implies to me that he only agreed to a poly relationship because he doesn't want to lose you completely, because maybe he worries that Smex is an important aspect of a relationship that he feels he can't fulfill to your requirements. And before I see people commenting, no, Astarion is not ace, he wants physical intimacy at the end, some people on the ace spectrum, like demisexuals, do have Smex and self-pleasure, you know? For demisexuals in particular, they just need to form an emotional bond with their partner first. Like everything else to do with sexuality, it's a spectrum and everyone is different. As I've said before, what Astarian says and what he actually wants are two different things. If you're doing the non-ascendant route, he will be just as happy for you not to propose the dirty and just spend time with him at his final scene. Plus, it's kind of an agreed upon thing that people on the A spectrum are typically the ones making the dirtiest statements and innuendos, so that still fits with his MO. I also think Astarion might fall into the Arrow spectrum. I picked this up when looking at the dialogue options for his final romance scene before you officially become a couple. Now, any other character, if you were to tell them that you'd prefer to stay friends, would get pretty upset, hurt, or heartbroken. Astarion, in the meanwhile, will be extremely grateful, if not as happy as if you were to ask him for a relationship. He doesn't crave romantic love like all the others. He just wants someone by his side, whatever that person may be to him. Of course, this is all my personal interpretation, and you're obviously free to disagree with me. Anyway, here is Astarion. Let me know what you think of my interpretation of his modern look in the comments below. And speaking of modern times and modern luxuries, how about getting access to Japanese snacks shipped straight from Japan to your front door every month? Because they definitely didn't have that in medieval times. It would have taken at least five months to deliver cargo by boat, and that's not even mentioning all the pirates. 
And that's why this video is sponsored by Tokyo Treat and Sakurako, my favorite sponsors ever because they send me food every month and my family and I always look forward to the next time their box arrives at our door. Tokyo Treat and Sakurako are monthly Japanese snack boxes that send you a different variety of treats depending on which box you subscribe to. Tokyo Treat will send you the latest, most exclusive, limited edition and seasonal flavored Japanese snacks that are only available in Japan for a limited time. Meanwhile, Sakurako supports local Japanese snack makers and will send you 20 traditional, authentic, and artisan Japanese snacks, including Japanese teas and a special Japanese tableware. This month's tableware item is the Tsukimi dish, which has an adorable rabbit on it. And as you guys know, I was born on the year of the rabbit, so this is a happy little coincidence. They have a different theme every month, so you can always look forward to something new. And if the snacks look a little bit unfamiliar to you, don't worry because each box contains a booklet that will tell you all about each snack as well as any allergen information. And it also contains a lot of information about Japanese culture. So if you're looking to get a gift for yourself or a family member or a friend or really anybody, check out the link in my description to get $5 off your first subscription. Thank you so much for hanging out with me in the pond for a while. I hope your skin didn't get too pruney. Let me know which Baldur's Gate companion is your current favorite and big shout out to my lovely pond dwellers on Patreon. If you want to become a pond dweller and get early access to my content, then join my Patreon. If you want to see more from me, then please follow me on all my social media. I'd really like to get 10k followers on Instagram, so if you could follow me there, that'd be awesome. If you want to submit fan art or chat with me, join my Discord server. And if you want more of my stories, check out my Wild Word series here on YouTube because that will make me really happy. All the links are in my description and I will see you all in the next video. Goodbye!